Okay, thanks Renee for the introduction and um, giving us the opportunity to present today about the Australian National Virtual Core Library. So today we're going to have um, Jessica, Monica and I will present about this um, project. Um, we're going to start with uh, a general introduction into the NVCL, what it's about, what is the background of this project and also maybe where we are going to. Um, in the future, and um, then Jessica is going to present about some case studies. Uh, one from um, an exploration case study from a very remote area where we have just a few drill cores. And then she will present another case study about uh, another little um, deposit called a big dam. After that, Monica will talk about the spectral reference library and uh, what we are doing in this field and also show a bit more, a few more applications of how to use NVCL data. Basically, so the National Virtual Core Library. Um, the reason why this uh, project started more than 10 years ago was basically that um, uh, a number of people, colleagues of mine, John Huntington, for example, um, observed the, the, the challenge of the Australian resources sector in that um, millions of dollars are spent on drilling, drilling for exploration, drilling in mine sites, um, but there's um, not that, not that much value extracted in the end from these um, drilled materials. The drill core logging is very subjective. It really depends on the background of the respective um, geologist and, and the experience of and training of these uh, people about how, let's say, how, how valuable the, these, these, these drill core logs, this visual drill core logging is. Um, there's little predictive um, geology value that can be extracted and so it's really hard to use this information for 3D modeling, for example, or putting together resource models. Um, the also, there are multiple, um, many different geologists maybe looking at um, um, what in one deposit or one um, tenement uh, logging drill cores. So um, it's really hard to compare those different uh, drill core logs. Um, also, the, the log mineralogy is um, only rarely used um, throughout the mine life. So when you, when um, industry is collecting, um, is doing the logging of drill cores in the exploration phase, not many companies are using that information then later on in, de in developing the resource, in um, understanding the mineral deposit and so forth. So then there's lots of re-logging done and re-drilling and so on. So again, use lots, lots of uh, money wasted in the end. Um, there's lots of information loss and repeated logging. And uh, in many, many cases, I've seen it myself also, and there's an image um, um, uh, provided by John Huntington um, down at the bottom of this slide, showing basically what happens to drill core of more than often. And it's uh, just dumped somewhere and no one looks after it. And then lots of, lots of investment has been done to get this uh, drill core out of the, of the earth, but then um, it's just dumped and the information is lost. So, um, the solution then that we were dreaming of basically would be developing a technology that uh, some kind of analytical tool that provides us with an automatic and objective logging of every type of drill core sample, drill sample, yeah, not only drill cores, but also course reject samples, pulps, and doing that at a minimal um, um, amount of required um, sample preparation. Yeah, we don't want to um, put another more burden or more costs onto the exploration and mining companies by developing a very fancy system where you have to do a lot of sample prep. Um, now we want to have a, a system that is very easy to use and um, um, provides objective um, drill core data. But in addition to this uh, collecting the data and developing a new system, um, we also want to develop the workflows and we also want to provide a, a web portal where everyone um, can access these data publicly uh, from anywhere on, on, on the globe, basically. So we also need to develop um, a, a portal. Um, and the benefits of doing these um, things is uh, obvious. Um, for example, it would add um, immense value to historical investments in the, um, to the drill cores that are stored by companies or also by historical surveys in, in the different uh, core farms and, and drill core libraries. And we would be able maybe to empower geologists with objective geoscience data, and especially in, 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 in relation to hyperspectral um, sensing, reflectance spectroscopy, we would empower geologists with mineralogy. So the National Virtual Core Library is uh, quite a large project, and, and as I mentioned, has been uh, running for um, a number of years now, and it, it consists, it comprises several components. 
Um, it starts off obviously with the material infrastructure, which is the drill core, the pulps, and, and other samples that are um, collected, and samples that are um, uh, drilled by the industry um, in, in, in the field, but also um, uh, material that is stored in these different drill core libraries um, by the different geological surveys or by the industry. Um, then, as in the frame of this National Metro Core Library project, Caesar Road developed uh, the HiLogger 3, which is um, a system that collects reflected light in the visible near shortwave and thermal infrared part of the spectrum. And it's doing this by, um, um, you can see in the image there, um, the picture of the HiLogger, uh, the HiLogger, the, that's the one at the New South Wales um, NVCL node in the Londonderry Drill Core Library. And basically, there you can put the drill core tray or the chip trays um, onto this table that you, that you see in the middle of the instrument, and that one moves in a snake-like fashion underneath the uh, different spectrometers. And then um, the reflectance spectra are collected, but also high-resolution RGB imagery, and uh, there's a laser uh, profilometer as well. So this is the high logger, but then um, the geological surveys are also collecting lots of other data sets to validate the high logger data, um, but also for their own research or if they get requests from companies, I guess. So they are collecting physical data. They, they have maybe an XRF. They have they try maybe LIPS, uh, desktop SEMs, desktop XRD, and all uh, different um, kinds of systems. So these are the tools. Um, to collect geoscience data from the drill course. Um, but um, with um, after collecting, and uh, we also need to uh, develop maybe workflows and procedures how to interpret those collected data. And in terms of reflectance factor, the NVCL is doing quite a bit of work on reference libraries. As shown, there are some examples of thermal infrared spectra of some lithium bearing minerals, uh, like the pitolite, for example. And um, we are building on this, we're building up a, a reference library, and Monica will talk about this later a bit more. But we're also helping um, to, de um, to develop some case studies and um, some example applications. And Jessica will, will, will talk about these ones a little bit later. The data then gets uploaded to this uh, portal, and this is actually part of our scope's um, discovery portal. So all the NVCL data are accessible through that portal. Uh, publicly available, internationally, and uh, freely available. And in this um, little um, diagram on the or web portal on the top, on the top right of this slide, you see that every red dot basically is represents one of the drill cores that is uh, that was collected by the NVCL. And we have now more than three and a half thousand drill cores available in this uh, database. And good, okay, so we've done basically what we what we promised, what we wanted to do. We wanted to, de to develop the technology, uh, a technology that collects uh, objectively, object, objective um, um, drill commonology, but also providing data in the portal. Um, but we also need to do quite, quite a lot of training, training the geological, geological surveys, training industry, universities, and we're doing a lot of workshops um, every year um, to, to train users into how to use these, these, these data sets. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a very large uh, project with uh, lots of different components and bits, of bits and pieces, and that certainly can't be, do by C can't be done by CSRO alone. Um, but we are working together very closely with the Australian State and Territory Geological Surveys and also universities and industry. And um, um, this is just this picture here, just this place um, um, shows the, the people that joined our NVCL community workshop that, that we run annually. And this is a picture of the last one in Sydney in, in ma early March this year in 2020, um, showcasing the, all the different people that are involved in the NVCL. Um, the next slide just shows some um, pictures of the, of the six different NVCL nodes, um, again, to, to highlight also how important the geological surveys are in this National Ridge Core Library, because without them, we couldn't do this, actually. Definitely not um, without them. So um, we have here some pictures from the different facilities. We've got um, six NVCL nodes across Australia. So starting from the top left, um, one in Darwin, one in Perth, Adelaide, Hobart, in Londonderry, so close to Sydney, and in Brisbane. And they all have similar facilities. They all have a high logger three, which collects reflectance, reflected light from the visible near shortwave and thermal infrared. 
Um, but they all, as I mentioned before, all have also different facilities, additional facilities. Some of them might have a desktop XRD or a desktop SEM. Others tried um, geochemical drill core um, data collection and, and so forth. Okay, and um, the, the data that are collected, mainly the hyperspectral data, the high resolution RGB imagery and the line profiler data, can be accessed through the through our scopes discovery portal and this one is um, uh, put together and looked after by our scopes virtual research environment Avery. so that's a separate um, um, infrastructure program of, of um, our scope and um, i just put there another screenshot of that portal and the red dots are again um, the the nbcl data or the the drill course locations of drill course that have been high locked and we can download data but it also shows another layer, which in this case is an Aster mineral map. And um, you see also highlighted in this screenshot um, the hydrogeochemistry. Um, so there are multiple geoscience data layers that you can access via this portal. Yeah? And um, so the OSCO portal is one additional, uh, is one um, output, let's say, or a way for accessing NVCL data. But there is also the OSGIN portal run by GeoScience Australia. Then each of the respective state and uh, um, geological surveys, they are operating their own portal, so you can access that also from them. And there's the course tools web page as well, which is organized um, or run by Andy Green, a, a former uh, colleague from CSRO who is um, looking after the data as well and doing a different kind of processing a little bit. So multiple ways how to access this data. Um, in the portal, what you can do very simply when you um, just type into Google, for example, OSCOP Discovery Portal, and then you select um, in the down pull menu on the left, you select boreholes and the National Visual Core Library, and you add that layer um, to, to, to that um, portal, then you will see all the red dots popping up, which are each of them is a, is a drill core data set. And this one not only works on your, on your laptop, but it also works on the tablet and the mobile phone even. Yeah? And um, if we, for example, would be interested at, um, in Ernest Henry in IUCG and in Queensland, um, uh, we could click on that dot and then get access to um, some um, drill core imagery, the trace. If you're interested in, in really reflectance spectroscopy, then you even can click on single points in a drill core tray and you can display visible near shortwave and thermal infrared reflectance spectra like in that image in the middle. You can also create a downhole plot of the of the mineralogy. So this is like an automatically generated um, um, uh, mineralogy overview of that drill core. And after looking at these drill core images and the, the downhole plot, if you feel like um, you want to know more about this drill core, then you can um, request download and you can um, open this, this um, data set in the Spectral Geologist software. There's a free viewer version of that software and you can um, look at the data at your leisure then afterwards. The, um, the things that you, um, so, so when you download the data, then you can look into more detail and um, an example, um, what you could do for example, is creating just some downhole plots of the mineralogy. And you see in this slide, basically downhole is on the X axis. So this drill core runs from zero to I guess roughly 800 meters depth. And um, there are different colorful plots. Um, at the bottom, this, this one shows the uh, summary of the um, mineralogy uh, uh, derived from the shortwave infrared. And you see the different colors. Each of the colors um, corresponds to a different mineral. Uh, so green, for example, very prominent there, corresponds to chloride. Um, if you compare that with the, with the second diagram, in the, so the one in the middle, let's say, um, that's a thermal infrared derived mineralogy. And um, so in there, again, you see the chloride in green, but you also see quartz in pink, for example. Yeah, this is, um, you see different results from different wavelength regions um, because different minerals are active in different parts of the reflectance spectrum. Um, and then you can put also pieces of the drill core on, um, on top of it, like, like uh, Jessica has done here in that case. And just to give some examples on how representative drill core looks like from that from these different rock types, and then you can maybe classify those um, those different rock types. So working 
you can work um, um, the, with the, the reflectance spectra, but also the high resolution RGB imagery in conjunction. And if you have downhole geochemistry or other data sets, you can upload that as well to TSG and then compare that with the reflectance spectra and the imagery. And as mentioned here at the bottom of this slide, um, you can do this for over 1 million meters of drill core across Australia. Yeah, so we have more than three and a, three and a half thousand drill cores now in the National Virtual Core Library, which are publicly accessible for everyone internationally, wherever you are on the planet, um, as long as you have internet connection. Good, so this is a general introduction into the NVCL and the um, parts of the portal. I just want to focus on one part of the portal a little bit more, um, the portal analytic, analytics, and this is something we are developing, we are still, um, are developing at the moment and it's basically um we, we've got three and a half more than three and a half thousand drill cores in that in that live in that drill core library this um, virtual library and so you could do a may in very um, interesting research um, um with, with, with this data set also and that's what we are trying to do uh, to make that also easy accessible and uh, do some online queries of the database so we've got this uh, portal data analytics and you can access them by um, hitting on this little yellow button there highlighted on the bottom left of that screen. Yeah, so where it says analytic. So if you if you display all the um, NBCL data and then you hit analytic button, um, then you can um, do some queries. And, and I would like to use an example from some research I'm doing right now at the moment. I, at the moment, because I'm working lots of my time on reflectance spectroscopy and trying to find out what kind of minerals have what kind of um, reflectance spectrum in different parts of the um, uh, in different wavelength ranges. And in the moment I'm looking at phosphates, appetite, and monazite and so on, I want, want to understand their reflectance spectra a bit more. So I simply put together um, a query and in this analytics portal, um, in this case, I wanted to look for um, uh, the appetite, um, I use the thermal infrared um, output uh, of the high loggers and um, um, I want, I'm searching basically for every drill core that has more than 50 counts of appetite per, per meter. Yeah, so this is summarized in, in this screen here now. Um, there's also a report about this and if you would like more detail about this, I can send you the report that has basically a detailed description about how you do that. But I just want to show you the rough principle. You basically any any mineral that you're interested in, any mineral group you can that is and that is mapped by by um, our system. You can um, uh, select it here in this uh, disc, in these uh, portal analytics and then see where where it occurs across Australia. Yeah? You can also focus in certain areas if you want and um, draw a polygon around the MacArthur Basin, for example, if you're interested in this area. Then you submit the research, the, the search function basically, and then you can check the progress of this one. And this is just a screenshot of some of the search functions I, I, I um, the searches I've done. And um, with these ones, you can um, then um, when you check the progress. If you if you look on the right hand side, there are some little icons. You can basically then um, once once the the, the search is, is finalized and you get the output, um, then you can display a map like this. So you see that the color of the dots, let's, uh, let's say, have changed. And um, this basically shows you the results of, um, in this case, um, which drill cores contain more than 50 counts of appetite per, per meter in the drill core. And these are only ones, the ones that are highlighted in blue. Uh, the red dots basically means no, there is no, that, there's not that much appetite in this drill core. And or orange means uh, there was an error. In, in the search function, and this might be because there is no thermal infrared data available for for this um, respective drill core data set. Yeah, so you get a quick overview where are appetites in in Australia, basically in this drill core database. Um, you can show it in a map, but you can also get a list of drill cores um, as, a, as a CSV file here, and these are all the drill cores basically across Australia that um, fit to my to 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 the to the search function I had. And um, you can also get the locations of, of that one. So we're still um, working on this and improving this, but it's just to, to show uh, roughly um, what, what you can do, what, what the potential is when, when you have access to the mineralogy of the upper one to two kilometers of, of the Earth's crust across the whole continent. Okay, 
Um, I had a few more examples, but um, just just to summarize again this part about the portal data analytics. Um, so there is a report about this with, with with the single steps, what you can do with it, and you can use the uh, you can use algorithms searching for minerals. You can use algorithms that are inbuilt into the spectral geologist software, but you can also use your own algorithm that you design. So for those people maybe that are um, calling in and they have more experience in reflectance spectroscopy, if you, for example, designed your own script that identifies the white mica abundance, um, then you can copy that script into that analytics portal and run the search for um, using your own algorithm, basically. Yeah. So I I want to just draw your attention to this report, and um, if you if you have questions about this, shoot me an email. Maybe it's the easiest case. Um, good. So the other two case studies I had were examples about garnets, um, but I presented about this during the previous uh, co video already, so I just skipped that. And you can basically think of all kinds of, of questions that you can ask this, this portal. Do you want to un, un, understand the, the, the composition of variations of garnets, for example, across the Australian continent? Are you looking for certain kinds of carbonate compositions that are related to certain um, maybe alteration footprints in certain areas? Um, so you can ask all sorts of questions to this portal. OK, I might head over to, to Jessica and just skip the next sli two slides so that Jessica will continue talking to us a little bit about how to add value to greenfields exploration with NBCL data. A little bit of musical chairs. All right, so like Karsten said, I'm going to quickly walk us through two case studies, um, one kind of from a greenfields perspective when you have a couple drill holes and one through the Olympic Dam, which is obviously very well drilled. So the first case study uh, we're going to look at is in the Forescue Group. So this is from a project uh, from a few years ago, um, looking at the stratigraphy of the Forescue Group um, just south of Karatha. So this is an area that was of interest because of some of the conglomerate ghosted hold nuggets that were, uh, gold nuggets that were found in that area. Um, and there's some historical drilling. So there's a 1984 CRA hole, which is about 2,200 meters long that found some nuggets at the base, um, at the bottom of the um, conglomerates. And that drew some interest given some of the showings closer to the surface uh, to the north. And so through the GSW EIS program, two new holes were drilled to try and understand the extent of those gold bearing conglomerates. And as their EIS holes, those were also high logged and have been uploaded to the MECL portal. So this allowed us a chance to look at these three holes to kind of look at the extent of these gold bearing conglomerates uh, look at prospectivity for base metals in the Tumbiana formation and look at correlating the stratigraphy of an area of the Fortescue group that um, isn't very well exposed. So Karsten showed a plot similar to this earlier. This is the thermal infrared um, hyperspectral mineralogy outputs for the three drill holes. So DD84MF1 is uh, the historical CRA hole and it's colored in the Medina formation, which is a, a metavolcanic. And then the two bottom holes, ABAD02 and 01, are the new drill holes, which have also been high logged. And they're colored in the Tambiana formation. And just by looking at the um, spectral mineralogy down hole in the therm thermal infrared, you can start to correlate the stratigraphy quite well. If you just look at the, the mineralogy of the Kailina formation, um, you can line that up and, and look at kind of how the, do we have uh, laser pointer? Here we go. <laughs> so there's the Kailina formation. It's a, a metavolcanic. You, you can see it's dominated by chlorite, quartz, um, plagioclase, a bit of K feldspar. And then above that, you have this Tumbiana formation, which is a, a meta sediment. Um, and then the Hardy formation below, which also has this interesting kind of unit up, up at the top that's uh, chlorite rich. And then in the two new holes, they are overlie, the Hardy formation overlies the basement. And then the far CRA hole, there's almost a kilometer or over a kilometer of hardy formation before you hit a basaltic in it. So by looking at this um, mineralogy, you can start correlating that stratigraphy. So you can also look at not just overall bulk mineralogy, but you can look at certain mineral um, spectral mineralogy features. This is an example of looking at chlorite abundance in chemistry using the 2250 nanometer feature, which is diagnostic for chlorite. And so again, you've got the three holes um, with the depth on the x-axis and on the y, you have the abundance of chlorite based on the depth of this feature. And then it's colored by um, the position of that feature, which is reflective of the chemistry. And you can see that 
by looking at this, you see this really interesting, really blue unit here, which is the top of the Hardy formation I mentioned earlier that's quite chloride rich. And this is a bit of a marker unit. It's really unique in its geochemistry. Um, we noticed it first because it's got this magnesium chloride um, signature, but then when you look at the whole rock geochemistry and trace element geochemistry, you see that it's actually really rich in nickel as well and other things. So you're getting some sort of ultramafic provenance for that sedimentary group. You can also use the chloride chemistry at the bottom here to kind of look at the provenance of these conglomerate units where you've got this basal unit, which is really similar um, both in overall mineralogy, but the uh, kind of abundance and um, chemistry of the chloride to the underlying Mount Roe basalt. Whereas up here in the upper conglomerates, you have a very different um, kind of chloride chemistry, chemistry, which may reflect a different protolith. So by looking at kind of one spectral parameter like that, you can get a lot of information. Um, if you want to look at another one, this is another commonly used spectral parameter. So the 2200 nanometer feature, which is related to the white mica in samples. And so again, you've got depth or depth along the x-axis, along the y-axis abundance of that 2200 feature. Um, and again, colored by chemistry where kind of the bluish colors are more um, muscovitic white mica and the reddish are more thengitic. And you can see at the base of the, or so the top of the Kylina formation here, you've got this very kind of strong fengite um, signal in all three holes, which also can be used as a bit of a stratigraphic marker for where you hit the top of the Kylina formation, but also has some interesting um, implications for hydrothermal alteration of that volcanic unit. You also see variability um, in the white mica composition down in the granitic basement. Um, which reflects some of the hydrothermal alteration through the spectral mineralogy. We also can get variation in things like epidote and chloride. So picking out hydrothermal veins in the granitic basement, indicating that you had widespread alteration. And then if you look a little bit closer at this section here in the Kylina formation, and you throw a bit of geochemistry in it, you see an interesting pattern. So the, this hyperspectral signature is what first kind of put us onto this. But when you look at um, downhole geochemistry, you see there's an enrichment in copper, this black, immediately above that, and a depletion of copper in this area that has a spongitic alteration in these two holes. You also see an increase in potassium, which is part of that alteration signature. And so it gets, gets you thinking, is there some sort of hydrothermal system going here where you might be leaching copper from the underlying volcanics, depositing it in the overlying sediments that are more oxidized? And how does that happen? Well, if you look at the Heilogger data, you can actually see both in the core imagery and in the mineralogy, that that's overlain by a thick stromatolytic unit. So there is potential there um, for having some sort of oxidized fluid going on in this, this lake. And so um, this is something we followed up further with uh, more detailed um, analytical work, including strontium and chromium isotopes. So this is just a bit of a um, teaser for that. So if you put that all together through these three holes, which are about 15 kilometers apart, you can start looking at things happening on the sub basin scale. So the first hole, H84MF1 is kind of in this central part of the subbasin where you've got this really thick section of hard, hardy sediments um, and you're not getting quite to the green basement. And these two other holes here are closer to the basin margins where you've got less um, sedimentary fill. But you see evidence for hydrothermal alteration in the hyperspectral mineralogy in the basement samples as well as here where you also find gold nuggets in the hardy here and we in the basement samples we did some high resolution xrf mapping using our my mapper and there are got gold micro nuggets in that as well so there's implications for hydrothermal um, alteration and um, kind of flow through the basement um, potentially moving gold around and then we also see this evidence for some sort of hydrothermal system moving copper around at the kylina hardy contact so this is kind of um the end, the end of the case study, but it begs some really interesting questions. All right, so that was an example of uh, using three drill holes in a relatively underexplored area to better understand the stratigraphy and, and mineral system potential. And now we're going to jump to kind of the exact opposite, which is Olympic Dam. So um, disclaimer, this is not, not my work. This is work of uh, Dr. Alan Moget, uh, formerly of the GSSA, now retired, but um, this has all been part of the NBCL project as well. So most of you probably heard of Olympic Dam, so world-class IOCG deposit, um, the world's largest copper gold uranium resource um, in the Galler Craton, South Australia. So this is a project that has been going on in collaboration with BHP. Um, and, and this deposit has several important mineral assemblages associated with mineralization. So one is feldspars. Uh, so I'm going to show some examples of using albite, microcline, and orthoclase um, from the Heilager data. Also ALOH micas. So, for example, the white mica example that I uh, showed you earlier, 
um, and other minerals like biotite, apatite, and iron oxides. The important thing to note is that all these minerals are actually mappable using high logger data. So PHP and GSSA undertook a project in which they are, are mapping a huge number of holes from Olympic Dam. In 2014, they mapped over, or not didn't map, but scanned over 20,000 meters um, of core across this section here, so right across the deposit from 30 drill holes. And then over the last two years, that's been followed up by another 40,000 meters from about 60 drill holes. So all these blue dots here are, are the new um, drill holes. So to date, 93 drill holes have been completed. This is an ongoing project, so the interpretations and things I'll show you are just a bit of a teaser what's to come, but the final results should be coming out probably early next year. So this is a kind of a, a plan view of um, the Olympic Dam uh, deposit. You can see there's the ore shells as defined by BHP and also this um, alteration shell, uh, which is they sometimes refer to as the biotite out shell, so where you lose um, biotite in that uh, regional um, alteration. And so if you look at this um, kind of from side view, this is just to give you an idea of the density of the drilling um, and how large data that we have in this area. So there's 93 drill holes who deposit. It's pretty, pretty amazing feat. So like I said, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how you can use some of the, the mineral indices from high logger data to, to understand um, the deposit. So first thing is K feldspars. So this is just um, a figure showing the abundance of orthoclase versus microcline in the drill holes um, from kind of the center of the deposit going outwards. And you can see that generally um, orthoclase is considered a, a higher temperature environment and in the core of the system you're seeing higher abundance of orthoclase, so that's in the blue. And as you go out towards the edges of the system, you have much less orthoclase, but also um, much less, or not much, but less uh, microcline as well towards the very margins of the, the ore system. The next one is, I think, is a really neat example. So this is the orthoclase microcline example was just looking at the TSA outputs of those summary plots that Karsten and I showed, showing the spectrally divided mineralogy. That's what that's using. This is um, using um, the spectrum analogy, but ref refined by a specific spectral feature, in this case, a 9800 9, nanometer feature of albite. And what Alan's done is create uh, these shells looking at the abundance of albite um, in the deposit. So these are five meter intervals where you have more albite in these more distal shells than you do in these um, more proximal shells. And it's interesting because this, this green shell here actually really well approximates that um, biotite out. Um, alteration envelope that BHP has defined. And then the red bits in the center are just a little bits of um, remnant albite, so very low abundance, but there is still remnant albite in the system. The next example I think is probably the most exciting. So this is an index that was derived um, by Alan called the DTO, um, the distance to ore. And so this uses um, plagioclase, Kelly feldspar, and quartz. And so this is derived purely from the mathematical weights from TSA, so those summary plots we showed you. Also taking into account the geological concepts um, around the relationship between cave feldspar and quartz and proximity to the deposit in this IOCG system. So the red shell obviously is ore, but these other shells are, are giving you kind of a, as you go further out, your DTO index is getting higher, so you're further away from ore. And so if you're ever in the absence of a detailed drilling, like here where you have 900 or 90, sorry, 90 drill holes, you could start using something like the distance to ore vector to start understanding the shape of your ore body. So this is kind of two end member examples of what you can do with very little data and a whole whack of data. So from here, I'm gonna um, hand you over to Monica, who's gonna talk about some of the, the fundamental research that's ongoing in ABCL. Hey there. So I'd like to talk a little about what's going on under the hood of all this in NVCL's spectral reference libraries. Um, we've got a, quite a few people working on this because there's quite a lot to do. Um, we've got a bunch of technicians, um, geologists, a real chemist and our honorary spectral nerd, John Huntington. Um, we've got a few programmers, Neil, we've got two Peters. Um, sadly, we're losing one of those Peters today, but he's going to a better place and that's retirement. So happy retirement, Pete. Um, and we've also got David Green and the Tasmanians on board. So that's good too. 
So what are we doing here? We're building a comprehensive digital collection of validated mineral spectra. This is surprisingly hard to find, and that's because it's surprisingly hard to do, uh, but we're trying our best. We've made quite some progress. Um, essentially, these spectra, most of them go from about 350 to 14,500 nanometers reflectance. So this covers the visible to far infrared parts of the spectrum, but we might expand this even further in both directions and maybe even to techniques such as Raman, depending on what the high is do in their new incarnations. Why are we doing this? Well, essentially using the spectra reference library, you can translate these funny spectra that the high loggers are collecting back into geology again. So if the role of the high logger is sort of to encode the rocks as spectra, the reference library unlocks it and translates it into a rock again, not just a cryptic looking wiggly line. We have three main bits of infrastructure in this. Um, our analytics are done mostly in three labs. So that's the FTIR lab, the electron beam lab, and the national geosequestration lab. We also have access to external um, instrumentation such as microprobes and the synchrotron. Maybe not at the moment, hopefully in a few months we can uh, put a proposal and get over there and uh, really get into some detail there. Uh, we have our online reference library which is in development but it's still usable, it's just not super pretty. Um, so we upload everything, we uh, collect to that and you can download it and use it um, and you can also check out our validation data. So this is what's missing from a lot of the other reference libraries online including the really big ones like USGS. There's a surprising amount of um, nasty spectra let's say. Um, I said I wouldn't swear in this webinar um, and there's <laughs> no proof that they are what they claim they are. Very often they're not. They do more harm than good. Um, but ours is hopefully doing a bit better than that. So the minerals will be as what we're claiming they are to be and we'll be able to prove it and we'll upload it all there for you to see and hopefully use. Um, we've also got an extensive collection of reference samples. Most of these are in the Mitchell collection here on the site at ARC. We've also got a rather extensive collection of samples on loan from museums and we can also order in new minerals. Oh, and those are real minerals in the collection. They're rather nice. Okay, you may be thinking at this point, it's spending a bit of money on collecting these wiggly lines. Why are you doing this? And that's a good question. That's what I thought too when I joined the project. But then I realized they're actually pretty economical. Um, it does take a bit of money to collect these in good quality and to validate them, but they're more than worth it. Um, if you calculate the value of a one drill core from the MVCL, it's actually worth about 300K interpreted, not to mention the price of actually collecting it in the first place. If you extend that across the entire MVCL, that's about a billion dollars. This is calculated using commercial rates, and we're CSI rows, so we don't charge those rates. But even if you knock off a few zeros, it's a lot of money, it's pretty good. How good's the MVCL? And we're also not just randomly collecting spectra. Uh, we do have a few um, guiding forces here. Uh, the main one is the MVCL itself and the people operating the high loggers. We align with their campaigns, for example, Olympic Dam, Mount Isa, we're working to get the right minerals into the library for them. Um, we're also here to help MVCL users, which we hopefully include you, to utilize the data. So for example, if you're looking through a drill core, something seems not quite right, you think there's a missing mineral, a dodgy mineral, we can work with you to collect a good reference spectrum for that and get it into TSG or whatever program you'd like to use. But I would recommend TSG. Um, we're also keeping up with Australia's critical mineral needs. For example, I've just finished up a custom reference library for lithium pegmatites. 
um, including minerals that no one really cared about a few years ago and now are critically important. So um, it's flexible. Um, we do try and align with what's going on in Australia and the world in general so that we're not just collecting wiggly lines. And this is an example from Green Bushes, which is the largest lithium mine. Well, I don't know about largest, but it's certainly the most productive in the world. I think it produces 40% of the world's lithium. And the main ore mineral there is, well, in fact, the only ore mineral is spodumene. So up until a month ago, we had a bit of a problem in that there wasn't actually any spodumene in the reference library. You can see this drill core here from Green Bushes. Looks like not the world's best lithium mine. There's a little bit of pyroxene there. Not much going on here. Certainly no lithium. Um, but in the latest version of TSG, we've added in a bunch of spodumene spectra and it's looking much better. Um, you're getting really well represented uh, pyroxenes, spodumene here. And it drops out a little bit here, but there's still plenty of it there. And you can see it's gone from 7% to 26%, which does better represent the deposit itself. Um, here's maybe even a better example from London Dairy. Um, so petalite um, alongside with spodumene is uh, what you're looking for if you're mining lithium in this situation. In the first one, there's nothing there whatsoever. Second one, we've added petalite into the library. You can see there's actually quite a bit of it in there. It corresponds very well with uh, the historical wall done by a geologist. So I don't know if you trust the geologist, it looks like you can also trust TSA in this case for what that's worth. Um, and it's looking a lot more prospective. You wouldn't mind the first one. The second one looks pretty good. So it's jumped from zero to 18% and you can see exactly where you want to actually process your ore. Is this accurate or is it just TSA doing its thing? Um, well, it does depend, kind of depends on a few things. Um, are the major minerals in your deposit active in the infrared range you're measuring? That's crucial for obvious reasons. Are the minerals actually in the spectral reference library? At this point as well, it depends. Depends on your deposit. In this case, yes, they are in there now, but they weren't before. So it would have been misleading if the correct minerals were not in the library. Um, and also, simple geology is better. If you've got too many minerals in the mix, it's um, programs like or algorithms like TSA aren't really unmixing them as well as you'd hope. Um, there's a lot of uh, non uniqueness of spectra. Um, you can always run it through a PLS algorithm if you're lucky enough to have or you're able to collect a good enough uh, calibration set. But generally, simple geology is better. Lithium pegmatite is nice and simple, works really well. You can see in these plots here, the top one is what uh, TSA thinks, just fully automatic. The second one is actual lithium values, which correspond very well with the spodumene because it's the only real uh, major mineral containing lithium there. And you can see it matches up pretty damn well. Um, there are some discrepancies, and in this case, I'd be willing to bet that that is more so because the geochem was taken only every metre, whereas the spectra were collected every centimetre. You can hear, see here in the, um, the amphibolite host rock a little bit of um, spodumene coming through which is actually another pyroxene orgite, uh, which doesn't look identical, but it looks similar. So TSA has said there's a bit of that there, like you might want to fact check that one. Uh, but other than that, it's done a really good job. Um, so it works, I think, brilliantly for lithium pegmatites um, now that all these criteria are fulfilled. And NVCL will be launching campaigns to test out other data sets too. Um, for example, doing XRD and running that through a high logger and seeing how it compares to another source of information. If you want to get even more accurate, you can also create scalars 
and you can even do a bit of machine learning if you're feeling really brave. Um, so here we can see a spodumene spectrum from our reference library. All I've done is I've taken the depth of this little feature here and applied it to the whole, um, in this case it wasn't a drill core, it was a set of matched pulps um, from two different lithium deposits. And just by tracking that one feature across all these uh, almost 200 samples, it's not done too badly. Um, you can see um, there's a little bit of ambiguity down here, but as soon as you're getting like a nice amount of spodumene in your sample, you're picking it up really well. Um, and if you do have a calibration set, you can refine it even further using PLS. Um, sounds scary, but takes about two minutes to do in TSG um, to create the model. And here you can see there's half as many points as in the top one, and that's because these are just the predicted values. It's not the model, but the predicted values compared to the actual lithium values, and it's superb. Um, the error is about that as what you'd expect from the geochemical lab itself. And yeah, it shows that all, it goes to show that all the information is contained in the spectra. You just have to get it out, scalars, using just one feature does a pretty good job, add in a few more and it will be looking a lot more like this. I'm going to hand back over to Carsten to say goodbye now. Thanks Monica and Jessica. Um, so um, before I say goodbye, uh, just a few more slides. Because <laughs> I guess you got um, the gist already of this uh, National Electric Coal Library that there's a lot in it. And um, so I just want to wrap up with a few slides. Um, so this National Virtual Core Library basically provides user-friendly online access to this vast resource of drill core mineralogical information from, from the Earth's crust. And you have seen now with the, with the examples that um, Jessica and Monica showed that how you can use this information also and how valuable that is. Um, I would say def uh, definitely it's the world's largest drill core mineralogical database, that's for sure. And um, we are collecting more and more data um, because we are also aligned with, with um, um, initiatives that are happening in, in Australia at the moment, other initiatives, other projects like the NDI and MINIC CRC. So we will um, upload all their drill core and um, uh, data sets also to the, um, to the um, portal at some stage, uh, once the data are collected and processed by the geological surveys. Um, there's also an increasing number of international geological surveys that are interested in this um, virtual core library concept. So we're working now with a, with, a, with a number of different countries and states of these countries to see if we can develop, um, help them developing their own virtual core library for their own country. Um, and there's a real big impact also for the Australian economy. And this is a very wordy um, slide here, or, um, but it's basically I took some parts of an interview that was um, done by Radio International, uh, Radio National, sorry, Radio National with uh, Lateral ec Economics, who did an um, estimate of the value of the impact of our scope, of all the our scope infrastructure programs. And um, well, the NVCL was not named as such, but um, there was a mention, if you read that on the bottom right, that um, um, where basically the concept of the NVCL is mentioned and um, how much, um, how people can use that basically and uh, what, what value there is for the Australian economy um, by, by, this, uh, by collecting those core samples and put them in the library and, and, and make them available online for everyone internationally also. So attracting business and industry to, to Australia. Um, but as it's, all, it's just possible with, with, with a large group of people and we have a really awesome community of um, people working on the NVCL with various backgrounds and, and uh, from the from the geological surveys, from universities, from industry, from uh, from CSRO, and um, that's it's it's a great initiative. And we are very lucky also that we can that um, we can continue this this um, uh, project. So it's already running more than ten years, but we've got now another two years of funding, and um, hopefully we'll continue um, also with this project in the in the, in the longer future. And um, just want to highlight again. The, the importance of the geological surveys, um, really these Australian drill core libraries are setting the world standard. And that's what's, what's coming clear, becomes clear also when we talk with international geological surveys and industries is like, okay, if you want to design a drill core library somewhere on the planet, just go to Australia, have a look what these guys are doing. 
Um, and so we're really, uh, CSRO is very happy that we can work with this, with the service on this and use their facilities for collecting all the data, like with the Heidelberger shown here in the top right again, using their facilities for demonstration um, of how the machinery works and so on, but also using training facilities in, in the drill core libraries. How can you get involved if you would like to? Um, well, simply maybe have a look what we are doing on the different web pages and also we have got a LinkedIn group. Um, uh, we do regularly uh, training uh, workshops and we had quite a lot of um, attendees over the past years there. And um, we are even now in these more difficult um, 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 times, um, we're continuing doing these uh, workshops now online basically. Yeah? So um, just have a look in, in the um, social media or other news outlets, um, you might, might find some um, um, advertisements for workshops. Finally, um, in terms of other resources, um, if you want to download um, TSG files uh, from the discovery portal or want to uh, get a better understanding how to work with the Heidelberg data, we've got two YouTube videos. So just type into YouTube NVCL, we've got our own channel there. And um, these are the first two videos we, we, will, we will add to those ones. Um, there's the CSRO Spectral Reference Library that, that Monica mentioned also. And this is still in, um, it's already live, but um, we are still improving it. In the end, we want to have a system where you can basically click. Um, you can basically go shopping. You can select the spectra that you need for your own uh, research or for your own project, and then can download that and um, use TSG or other software packages to integrate your spectra. Um, have a look at the OWSCOPE. Um, uh, web page. So we, there are quarterly news by the Auscope infrastructure program about all the different um, um, programs, projects in there. Um, and that's that's good to be kept up to date. And of course, if you're interested in the applications um, that, for example, um, Jessica and Monica showed. So there, we, there is a special issue in the Australian Journal of Earth Science from 2016 um, that was led by John Huntington, but there are many, many more publications that, that explain how uh, you can use these data that are produced by the National Virtual Core Library. Okay, so that's all the slides we have to show you. Thank you a lot. And I might hand over to Renee if there are any questions.